Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to React Native, build rich windows and mobile applications easily using JavaScript. My name is Paul Gus Marino. I work on the uh, CoreOS platform at Microsoft, uh, Windows platform, and on uh, user experience technologies, fluent design, and React Native for Windows, uh, which sits on top of that core uh, platform. My name is Kiki St. Ange. I work with Paul on the Windows app development team. I've been with Microsoft for about four years. I've been working mostly on XAML controls through theming and branding. I actually come from a game development background, but now I've moved over to working with React Native and cross-platform development specifically for Windows. Uh, so just to give us a sense of uh, who's here in the audience, uh, is anyone here actually a React Native developer? Like you've, you've published apps, you write React Native code. Okay, a few of you. Is anyone here interested in React Native development but hasn't done React Native development before? It's kind of the most of you, all right. How many of you are familiar with React or React.js web development? Oh, awesome. Okay. Definitely a lot more. <laughs> wow, a lot, okay, good. Yes. Uh, are there any people here, Windows developers? You write, you know, UWP, WPF, WinForms, MFC, Win32, Com Control. <laughs> no, no one does that. Oh, maybe a little bit. Uh, How many of you do cross-platform development regardless of React or React Native? Awesome. Very cool. All right. Good. That gives us a little sense of folks who are here so we can kind of uh, tune to that. Well, I think today's talk and the content will be relevant to everyone in, in all those categories uh, of uh, folks here. Uh, we're going to spend a little time at the opening just talking about the big picture, what's going on in the world of React Native and what we're doing at Microsoft in this space, especially in bringing it to Windows. Uh, and uh, then we're going to spend most of the time with Kiki deep diving with us and showing us code and building React Native uh, for Windows you, uh, app uh, and, and service delivering it with code push and editing in VS Code using a lot of good Microsoft technologies. And then at the end, we'll uh, do a little roadmap uh, and next steps about what's going on, how you can start getting involved. And, and if there's time, Q&A during the session, otherwise afterwards. Uh, and so during the talk, there's this wallet budget app that Kiki built that we'll use to, uh, as a sample that we'll use to demo some stuff. So do you want to just show it off? Yeah. So here we have an app that was written entirely in React Native JavaScript and is running on all of our native Windows platform controls. So it, it's an app that's supposed to simulate the finances and the inflow and outflow of, in this case, uh, Miss Rita Wang's expenses and budget. It has three different principles to it or different pages. We've got dashboard, my wallet, and all purchases. And this is really just supposed to demo all the React kind of React Native to native controls that we have available. So here on the dashboard, we have our native progress bar. So this is uh, UWP XAML control. We have a native calendar view, as you can tell by reveal and the animations in and out. We have embedded scroll views that are adaptable when you hover over them. We have a breakdown of expenses here. Unfortunately, Rita doesn't have anything in vacation. Hopefully, that'll change. Maybe after build. After build. And then down here we have a small table example of the recent purchases that she made. And since this is a UWP app written in JavaScript but running entirely on the Windows platform and has adaptability as you, and scalability as you'd expect, so if this was running on a tablet or a smaller screen, it would adapt accordingly. The second page that we have is My Wallet. And this is a page that's demonstrating a little bit more of the data manipulation and sort of the back end that you can you can write in React Native. So all of it's written in JavaScript. And in this case, it's showing Rita all the cards or credit cards that Rita owns in her possession. And if she creates a new card and she wants to give all of that detailed information to her wallet budgeting app, she can add a new card. So I'm just going to do that and, and demonstrate some of the native controls there. And while Kiki's doing this, it's interesting to note that she's using the keyboard and the mouse to tab around, type things in, combo boxes and things, or the native Windows combo boxes. And so even though people might think of React Native as a mobile technology, React Native for Windows really is a full desktop experience technology that has keyboarding and accessibility and mouse and all the kind of support you'd expect of a native Windows app that's running on a desktop. Yeah, and as some of you may know, the UWP platform supports not just tablets and PCs, but also the Xbox console. So since this is React Native app, fully native, Windows platform app, this also supports not just things like mouse and touch, but also the Xbox controller. And I'm actually going to give you a small demonstration 
of that in this finance app. I'm gonna use my Xbox gamepad controller to navigate my finance app, because why not? And I will also turn on my sound, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the surround sound of the navigation for uh, the Xbox controller. Ideally, I don't know if my sound's on. There we go. Navigate up and down, move this way. And if you're wondering why, when I moved down from all purchases, it didn't immediately go to add a card or remove a card, is because that's 2D navigation. And so the navigating with the gamepad controller is a little bit different than navigating with the keyboard because it's trying to see in space what makes sense to move to, not just the next tab index. So yeah. yeah so you're getting the full power of UWP though, in terms of all the inputs it supports, the ability to run across Xbox, PC, and other form factors, all behind React Native in this app. And the last page we have here is the All Purchases page. And this is a simple table control of all of Rita's purchases this month. And it's, it's giving you a, a list or a virtualized list collection in, in a heavy data format as an example of that. So I'm gonna pass it back off to Paul, all who's right. going to talk to us about sort of the high level of React Native for Windows. Awesome, thanks. So that just shows a little bit of what you can create with uh, React Native on Windows. And, and we'll kind of dig into that more. But stepping back to the uh, big picture, uh, React Native is one of a number of technologies you can use to create native client experiences and user interfaces today. Uh, of course, you can write natively to each platform. For example, you can write natively to the universal Windows platform if you're trying to target Windows devices. And that gives you the most direct and performant and straightforward way to unlock the full power of that operating system, the full power of that platform. But a lot of people, and I saw a lot of hands in this room indicate that, also need to reach cross-platform. And sometimes they can do that by writing natively to each platform, but there's also a certain cost associated with that and complexity, and so uh, people turn to some cross-platform solutions. One excellent cross-platform solution is Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, and that really appeals to people who are coming from a .NET background and want to use .NET technology, C Sharp, and so forth, to reach across platforms, and, and, and that's a sweet spot that that hits. Uh, and React Native is a similar technology that's cross-platform, but it, it speaks to an audience that's wanting to use JavaScript and web ecosystem technologies and web development style approaches and deployment and so forth. Um, and so what's really great about React Native is it lets you get a lot of the benefits of native UI development and native experiences, but use those web skills, those web programming languages, and leverage that big web ecosystem uh, as part of doing that. And so you know, today's talk is about that, uh, building native apps using JavaScript and React. Uh, Mike, uh, you know, just as a little like, you know, where React Native is, um, this is kind of a uh, fact some of you may know, but it's uh, very popular. There's tens of thousands of apps shipping to stores using React Native uh, today, so it's a very popular uh, technology. These are apps from major Fortune 500 companies as well as hot new startups. If you go to the React Native homepage, you'll see logos of companies and apps you surely recognize. Um, and it's actually growing uh, rapidly. An industry report recently showed 75% growth in the number of apps using React Native uh, since the start of 2018. Uh, and there's a large community around React Native, a lot of developers involved and contributing. Uh, there's 75,000 or more stars on the GitHub repo for React Native. Uh, and for the last two years, it's been the second most contributor to project on GitHub. Uh, so the only thing above that is VS Code, actually, from Microsoft. Uh, but very large, engaged community uh, around React Native, lots of apps, lots of development. Um, and so for that reason, Microsoft really wants to help developers, uh, internally and externally, all of you, take advantage of this technology uh, from, from Microsoft in, in a few different ways. Uh, one is bringing React Native uh, to Windows. And so what we announced yesterday was React Native uh, for Windows the next, we're calling it. Um, so kind of the next generation of React Native for Windows that's, I'm gonna go into more depth on, but it's uh, based on the new common C++ core with Facebook, so there's a lot more code sharing across iOS, Android, and Windows, a lot more performance and, and other benefits that we'll get into. Um, Microsoft also makes VS Code and the React Native tools for uh, VS Code, which is, you know, if not the most popular, uh, I think it probably is the most popular way people do React Native uh, editing today, and it's a great experience. Um, I'm, a lot, I'm sure a lot of you use it for React too. Um, Visual Studio App Center provides great services for application developers to get telemetry, uh, crash reports, manage in, you know, instrumentation, uh, manage deployments of things, and they have some great services for React Native apps that allow you to push code very rapidly. 
um, as well. Um, and finally, Microsoft uses React Native quite a bit. A recent industry report calculated that we've, I think, um, more than 35 apps uh, for Microsoft in various stores that are using React Native. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's something that we're supporting, you know, across a few different ways as a technology and, and want to help you take advantage of it uh, to, reach, to reach Windows and, and other Microsoft services. React Native for Windows, there's really three big value props to it that if there's only three things you kind of remember about it, these would be those three things in my mind. One is that it lets you build Windows apps easily using JavaScript. If you know how to use React to create a web app, then you know how to use React Native to create a native app. And, and Kiki will show this to you. But if you've come from doing uh, PWA or Electron development, if you've been doing WWA or HWA on Windows, um, this is a really cool path forward that lets you use your JavaScript code and your JavaScript skills um, and create native apps. Um, these are truly native apps with a truly native experience. And so as you saw a little bit in that opening demo, when you're using React Native, you're, if you create a scroll view, it's a native platform scroll view. If you create a text box, it's a native platform text box. And so you really have 100% unfettered access to the full platform, composition, effects, whatever you want to do. And that's different than most other technologies that let you use JavaScript to, to reach a Windows. So if you use a PWA, you're limited in the sandbox of what the PWA kind of cross-platform web APIs allow. So if you want to access the file system, you can't do that until PWA adds file system access support, for example. Um, if you use Electron, you can access all the kind of underlying system-y kind of APIs, things like file system and Bluetooth, but you can't access the UI technologies, really. And so if you want to do cool visual effects, if you want to use native controls, if you want to interoperate with native UI that you've written or other native controls people have made, you can't do that. But React Native lets you do that. It really gives you unfettered, interoperable access to the full uh, native uh, platform. And that also means it's much more incrementally adoptable. So you can already have a Windows app, for example, you can start to use React Native in it. You don't have to rewrite uh, from scratch using it. Um, and finally, uh, React Native for Windows lets you have a web-like inner and outer development loop. Uh, you're just editing JavaScript files for 90% of what you're doing, and so you're just typing away, hitting control S, saving, and UI is updating, just like as if you were doing web development. Um, and because they're JavaScript files, these are things that you can just push out to apps uh, through in stores and rapidly roll out features, do experimentation, A-B testing, optimize your experience for your customers without going through some of the slower deployment mechanisms and store policy checks and things that you typically have to do with native apps. Um, and so it gives you much more web-like inner and outer development loop, even though you're building a native app. <coughs> so that's kind of React Native for Windows in a nutshell. And I think we're going to dig in now with Kiki showing us uh, the programming model. Yes. So we're going to start with React and sort of go over an overview of how React works for those of you that don't know, which I think is actually a pretty small portion of you, so maybe this is old. But we're going to go over how this is structured. So what I have here is a React web app running in my Edge browser. As you can tell right here, it's locally hosted. Uh, it's a simple EULA agreement, so it has an embedded scroller with text, it has a web, two web components, one being an input type of checkbox and another one being an input type of text box or text input. And really simple logic that when I check this and I agree to my Bacon EULA agreement, then I can now sign down here. So let's look at what the code looks like to write a JavaScript React web app like this. I'm gonna highlight some chunks and go through this and sort of describe how it's structured. It's not long or hard at all. So this, this first half we got, we have an import at the top, and if you're familiar with C Sharp and C++, this can be thought of as a using namespace or a header file include at the top of your file, and it grabs certain APIs and components from, in this case, React. I have some global variable definitions, grabbing some, some URLs, and then I have the start of my class app, which is holding the bulk, all of that app that you just saw running in my web browser. Inside that, I have some local variable definitions. The second half are two functions. One is a function that's called after this component has finished initializing. Component did mount is just, hey, when this component class is done, call me. And inside this, I'm fetching that EULA text and placing it inside that scroll viewer. The second one is a, it's that little bit of logic that when you hit that checkbox, it toggles on that text box at the bottom, so it's just toggling a bool. 
And the last function we have here is the render function. And this is where all of my layout properties, styling, and the general format of the way that I want my web app to look is going to sit. And if you're familiar with web development and HTML, all of this is HTML and CSS. We have div tags, labels, and so on, and what forth. So this is, this is the basic structure of a React or React.js app. And the last thing that Paul mentioned was that hot reload, where you can easily add a component or change something and hit save, and it'll instantly, or almost instantly, reload your app and show you those changes, in this case, in my browser. So let's, let's do a small example of that. I'm just going to add an image component. Let me scroll up your web page. Yes. Mysterious, I wonder what this image will be. Will it be chicken? Spare ribs? Porchetta? And there we go. Uh, it's Sorry. a React native for Windows logo. Oh, bacon, I should have chosen that. Oh well. So here we go, I've added an image component, I've hit Control S, and I am on the uh, Ethernet, so I, it was really fast. So here we go, loaded in my web page, we have a new component, we're ready to go. So let's look at this a exact same EULA agreement format in a native Windows platform app. So what we have here is a bacon EULA agreement in a similar format running on a native Windows app. And as you might be able to tell, these controls that it's using are not web components, they are native UWP XAML controls. So here we have a much more sleek looking scroll view that when you hover over expands for my mouse. Obviously, it has nice velocity when I do touch. We have touch-friendly hit targets for this checkbox down here. And of course, since this is all native, we also have support for other input types. And you thought I was done with using different input types. I'm not, because I'm going to show you the pen. Wow, I could not read that. RAI is getting really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's why I use the pen. All right, so that's the basic look at the React Native app here running. So let's look at the code for this exact same Windows platform app, side by side with the React web app one that we just saw. So I'm going to split this one to the right, scroll to the top. As you can probably tell right off the bat, these are extremely similar in the way that they're implemented. In fact, all of my business, business logic JavaScript is exactly the same. So my public variables like the EULA and my component did mount, my functions that are called after that app class is finished initializing, and my checkbox handling of that logic is all exactly the same between the two different apps. So the JavaScript I don't have to change. The only minor difference down here is the render function. So instead of having divs, I have views, and instead of having input of type checkbox, I just have checkbox. And as a UWP XAML developer, I actually find the React Native to be a lot more intuitive because coming from a XAML environment, this format is a lot more conductive to what I'm, I'm actually working in. So, and the reason for having views and checkboxes and instead of using HTML is because these controls are interopping directly with the native equivalents. And instead of doing divs and using the web component in HTML, they're saying, hey, I want whatever the native scroll viewer is for iOS or Windows, instead of just using a generic web component. So as you might expect, since this is a, an extension on React, you actually get all the goodness that you get from the React in React Native, and that includes the hot reload. So we'll actually show you a similar example that running here in our UWP app. I'm holding out for a photo of bacon this time. But I guess since it's the same code, it'll probably not be. And I do have to add the component at the top. So this is the only extra step, and this is because I want to tell the system, hey, I want that image component that's native on whatever platform that your my endpoint is. So hit save. And here, oh, I think I missed a zero. There we go. Live and reload. Voila. So live reload. I made a mistake. Just going to edit it in, quickly save, and there we go. We have our changes instantly. So I don't have to rebundle that JavaScript. I don't have to relaunch any apps or compile no, or build no anything. No F5 compile. No F5 compile, just, oh, I made a mistake, save, let's go. 
So, and actually this whole time, since this is React Native, it can run across anything. It actually is also running on this Android device that I have here. So I'm gonna switch to AirDrop and show you this, since obviously you can't see my tiny phone right here. Uh, oh, I just hit the power button. There we go. I'm gonna show you the scroll. It's a little bit slow since it's live casting here, but as you can see at the bottom, it has material design components. So we have a checkbox with the appropriate animations for that and the text input, which is gonna pop up the appropriate way to input something on an Android device in this case. So that's the, the basics of yeah. programming in React and how that trans translates over and is, is very similar to the way that you can program in React Native. I'm gonna yeah. pass it off to Paul to go over how you can start getting started today. Yeah, that was great. Uh, very easy to just go from React to React Native. Uh, and so what about just getting started with building a new project from scratch? Uh, how, do you, how do you go about doing that? If you've done React uh, development before or web development before, this will seem more similar to you. If you've come from just building uh, UWP or Windows apps with Visual Studio, it's a little bit different because it's very command line centric. You get to use that beautiful new terminal app uh, a lot uh, doing React Native development. And so you install the React Native command line interface and any dependencies uh, it may have, so it needs Node. Um, if you're building for Windows, you need Visual Studio installed. If you're building for Android, you need Android Studio installed and so forth. Um, you uh, use the React Native init my project or whatever you want to call your project to instantiate kind of a solution. Uh, and that'll have all the basic files you need to get started. It'll have the endpoint runtimes for Android and iOS by default. Uh, and this is 100% the same as creating a React Native app if you're doing it for iOS or Android or anything else. It's exactly what you do. And the one extra step to take advantage of React Native for Windows is to load in the Windows plugin. And so that's one extra step. You npm install that into that solution. And then all of a sudden, that React Native project has been updated to have iOS, Android, and Windows as outputs of it. And this is the same way you might uh, plug in other endpoints, too. And um, so one of the things I mentioned at the start is, that t is yesterday we introduced the new v next of React Native for Windows. And so if you were to type th this command right here, React Native Windows, today it would use the current main line, uh, kind of the v current uh, of React Native Windows. If you want to come uh, join us and be an early adopter and, and try out the new preview, you'd type uh, React Native Windows dash dash template v next. And then I'll give you the v next version. Okay, so it's the same new get, uh, sorry, M npm package, uh, but um, you can, you can at, at creation time, decide which version you want to go use. And so let's say you've done all this. This is kind of boring to sit and watch. What, what does it look like after that's happened, Kiki? Yes. Once you've installed all of the prerequisites and you've done React Native init, in this case, I did my project, you're going to get a folder file structure that looks like this. So up here, this is where my project is sitting inside my documents. And these are all the files and folders that I'm going to get. So all of this is generated by default for you. And here you have app.js and app.windows.js right here at this root. And this is where you'll do all of your React Native JavaScript programming, right here in this root is where you'll just branch out and create all of your file structures from here. And the reason why there's an app.js and an app.windows.js is depending on whether or not you want different JavaScript files to run, depending on the platform that you're targeting, you can specify that by doing app. the name of the platform .js. If you don't care and you want it all to be exactly the same, just don't specify that and just do app.js and then you're good to go. So once you've written all your JavaScript or if you just want to, you've installed it, you've initialized everything, you just want to run it and see what happens, you just go into your command prompt, you do react native run Windows or iOS, depending on the platform that you're targeting. And it will bundle up your JavaScript and compile everything for you and, and run it for you. But we're gonna do a little bit more behind the scenes to show you exactly how this is structured and how it works. So you may also see here that we have an Android folder, an iOS folder, and a Windows folder. And that's because in each one of those is the equivalent on that platform of a Visual Studio solution. So if we go into the iOS folder, you'll see here there's an Xcode project. And right there is their equivalent of Visual Studio. So everything that you need if you are on a Mac OS to develop an iOS app is there. So if there's anything specific to that platform that you want to write, you can open it up directly and edit it right at that level. And that's up to you. I don't own a Mac and I'm not on one, so I'm not gonna go in there and show you, but I am gonna go into the Windows one and show you. <laughs> so right here under the Windows folder, you'll see there's a myproject.solution. So we'll open that up and see what we got in there. Here. I think it's already running and it shouldn't be. Okay. All right, 
So what we have here is a blank UWP app. And if you're familiar with UWP XAML app, and if you're familiar with UWP XAML and you look over here at the side, you'll see app.xaml and mainpage.xaml. So when you go into Visual Studio and you go create my Win10 app, this is the structure that you're gonna get. So super familiar there. And this is where you would write all of your custom components to later surface up, which we will touch on a little bit later. So once you've opened this up and you've done some stuff where if you want to run it manually, you just hit F5. So in this case, I am going to start without debugging. I'm gonna boot it up, and this is what I, how I get. Welcome to React Native, and it points me back towards that app.windows.js. Since this is a Windows native app, it's gonna point me towards the respective .windows. JS file, and that is back at that root that we were talking about, back here. So now I can open that up. It's right here, and this is all pre-generated. When I do React Native init my project, it pre-generates it, as you can tell by this nice comment at the top. Facebook's like, hey, I did this all for you. Feel free to get started. So you don't have to remember what the import calls look like or what the basic class looks like or how to set up style sheets, because it gives you a little bit of everything, so you know in general what that looks like. And as you build out your more JavaScript files, you can add more of these, and this is basically your template to get started. Once this is up, since it's all in that same vein, it has the hot reload already all set up for you. And if you didn't want to launch it manually, that React Native run windows will set all of this up for you. You don't have to go into Visual Studio. You can just go right to VS Code and launch everything from there. So. Oh, what kind of controls do we get for, by default when we do okay. this? Awesome. Um, so <clears throat> uh, set up that app. Uh, you know, if you're using, once you're using React Native for Windows, you have access to the full React Native platform and ecosystem to take advantage of to build your app. And so React Native has a set of core components and core APIs that kind of are standard that come with it. Um, it's moving towards something called Lean Core for those who've been following it, and, and the React Native for Windows project is keeping up with that and supporting the Lean Core. Um, and so this gives you, you know, a very uh, standard baseline set of things you'd probably want: scroll views and text inputs and virtualized lists and, and so forth to build your app up, and a bunch of core APIs for accessing cameras and location and, and the kind of usual stuff you'd expect. Um, but there's also a whole large community of libraries uh, around React Native controls and other APIs and things that have been developed. And you can take advantage of those as a React Native for Windows developer. Now they tend to fall into two categories. Some of the components and controls and, and APIs that have been exposed in the community are written on top of the core of React Native. So they're written on top of those primitives. And those you can just use as is, 100% on React Native for Windows. Some of those things in the community have been built have been built natively over the native iOS or native platform and kind of wrapped those to React Native. Uh, and so some of those have Windows versions of them as well. Some of them don't yet at this time. That's one of the things we're going to be engaging with the community on to beef up the support for Windows of those ones that are missing. Um, but there's a bunch you can take advantage of right away on Windows. And there's others that are just a step away from uh, being able to support as well. And so let's see, just taking advantage of kind of those core controls and what's in the community, how we can beef up kind of this app and build it. Yeah, so we're gonna go back to this Wallet Budgeter app and take a look at how it was written. So it was written, 99% of it was written with those core components that we saw there, using the view, the text inputs, the picker controls, all of that, that goodness that you get with the React Native core. Uh, and we're actually gonna take a look at the My Wallet page because this is the really rich page and has utilizes a lot of the core components all in one, especially this Add Card page. So what we have here is we have our native combo box, our native text box, our native text. So if you're this for accessibility, all this text would scale appropriately and look great. These are all just built into the core. All built into the core. So taking a look at the implementation of this, I have my Add a Card page here. Uh, these are the, the text. It's, signaling the labels for those particular text inputs, which we have here. And then for the picker control, in this case, it's accessing our native combo box. If it was on iOS or Android, it would access their equivalent. And if, it, if you're familiar with XAML development, this is set up actually very similar to the way that we set up our, our combo boxes today. So up at the top here, we'll see that I am implementing text input, text, view, all from React Native. And that's the set of core controls. The other part that is not native to this but is actually utilizing the community control is this all purchases page. 
So right here is that simple table control that was showing you all the recent purchases in that month instead of just the past five. And this is a community control. This is written entirely in JavaScript that I installed through NPM. So if you know the name of the community control that you want, you go into your PowerShell and do your root, you do NPM install and then the name of the component and where it puts it is right here in this node modules folder. That's where all of your community components will stay. And if you write your own separate community components, community, because you are a community, uh, <laughs> they will go inside that node modules folder too. So even if you've written your own and you don't want to share it with anybody, you can still put it in there and it'll work the way it does every other community component. And how you access that, if we go to the all purchases page, you'll see right here I import it the same way I would import from React Native or React, and I access certain components that he's written to bubble up there in the JavaScript. And this is the name of the component, and this is the link to this npmjs.com that has a bunch of community controls that are super easy to navigate and steps for installation. If you wanted to use this community control today, that's where you would find it. Uh, this is how I import it. And I can even F12 on here and go into the code that they wrote, and this is not my Jolm JavaScript code, but if I did want to go in there and tweak it, I have full unfettered access to that node modules folder. So if there's anything I need to tweak at my level because my app needs something really specific in the table control, I have access to that. Nothing is restricted at that level. I'm gonna hand it back over to Paul to go over other ways that you can interact with the actual platform that you're on. That's right. So in addition to having access to the full React Native community of components and APIs and so forth, you also have access to the full native Windows community of controls and APIs and capabilities and so forth. And so code you've already written, things built into the platform, community toolkits, various other libraries. Um, and so here's a kind of a little bit of a diagram that helps explain that. But when you're writing your React Native component, you're writing to those React Native you know, primitive implementations for Windows or iOS or Android, uh, and which then in turn write to the native Windows or iOS or Android platforms. But sometimes you've written or there's some component that's been written natively for that platform you want to access. And React Native gives you a mechanism to wrap that in, in a view manager and access it from React Native too. And so uh, Kiki's going to show you that. There's really three models of interop that are possible uh, with React Native, which makes it very flexible. One is what we call sur you know, the surfacing model. Surface something you've written natively up through React Native so then you can access it with React Native tags in JavaScript. The other way is the flip of that that we'll show you as well, where you can have an app that you've written natively, but you just want to have some React Native UI showing up inside it and very integrated into it. Keyboarding, accessibility, everything works very seamlessly because it's all that one native UI tree. Um, and then finally, we're going to show you Win32 uh, apps can also, because of XAML Islands, host all of this as well. And so there's a lot of flexibility and interoperability with React Native to start to adopt it incrementally if it makes sense for you to do so, to wrap existing things and move forward existing native things you're writing with React Native. Um, so I think Kiki's going to show us all three of those cases. Yes. Number six. Oops. There we go. Cool. So we're going to take a look back at this app. The other 1% of this app that was not written in the React Native core components is this very rich, fluent designed calendar view that we have here. This is a fully native Windows platform control that is not in the core set. And I wanted to surface that up into JavaScript so I could use it. And the way that I surface it up is through something called a view manager. And there's a small disclaimer here. We are working on getting this view manager to be able to be written not just in C++, but also C Sharp. Today, what we have right now is still C++, but it's in very next. In the vNext, yes. Obviously, in C Sharp, you can write everything that you want in C Sharp. So we're going to take a look at the C++ implementation of it, but the principles are the same across the, the movement to the C Sharp version of it as well. So we'll go in here, and here is the this is the beginnings of the view manager. And you don't have to worry about all the includes that we have here at the top because we, when you install and you do, you install the Windows plugin, we will give you a framework template, a framework element template, which is our view manager template that will include all of this base that you'd need to start writing your own view manager and surface up your own control. So in this case, you don't have to remember all of this, all of this stuff at the top. All that's important to you to write for writing your own control here is creating an instance of it, create view, and in this case, I'm creating a calendar view, I'm grabbing our native control calendar view, specifying the properties from that control that you want to surface up into the JavaScript layer. So this is really cool because if there's certain 
properties on that native calendar view control that you don't care about, you're not gonna use, you don't have to surface them up and clutter your JavaScript with all this extra stuff or have to think about managing it. You're like, I just want these four things, I'm just gonna bubble those up and then I'll use them at my JavaScript layer and I don't have to worry about it. If you're writing a custom component, this is also something that's very valuable to you. This works for custom components as well as native components that pre-exist in the platform. The last step that you have is to define what each one of those properties does at the native level. So in the case of this control, since it was a native control that pre-existed through XAML UWP, I didn't have to do much here. I just said, hey, it's a string. Place that string in the string. I'm good. But if you're writing your own custom control, you might want to do something special here and handle that property a little differently for your own case. So once you've written this view manager and you've recompiled at, the, at this Visual Studio native level, how do you access this at the JavaScript layer? And if you remember from the community component, how we were just importing his JavaScript components directly from the name of his special component, which was React Native Table Component, we can go back to VS Code, and I'm going to the home page, which has that dashboard. And you'll see here, and since I wrote this in the React Native uh, plugin, it's, I'm importing it from there. But if you had your own name and you put it inside that node modules folder and you called it my component, then you would, imp you would import my control from my component. In this case, I'm importing calendar view from React Native Windows node module. So if we go down to calendar view, right here, and this is how I call it, the same way I would call a checkbox or a text input, any of the core controls, it's all called the exact same way. Very XAML-ish here, because we just have that bracket and calendar view, and you're good to go. The second option that you have that Paul mentioned was to have a part of your native Windows app running React Native, and the rest of it being 100% native XAML, or native Windows platform. So in this case, we're actually going to make just a page in this app be my wallet budgeter app. And we're gonna have a navigation view, navigate between a regular uh, Windows platform, Windows UWP XAML page to my wallet budgeter app. So we're gonna close this down. Take a look over here at my solution explorer. You'll see I have an info page, a navigation page, and a React page. And on my React page, You'll see that I'm, I have my React control, and this is what was taking over my entire app and showing me that Wallet Budgeter app. On the info page, you'll see that I have entire JavaScript just writing and setting up a small layout for information. And XAML. It's all XAML, yeah. And my navigation page, with all XAML, I've set up a navigation view, so this is a default component that we have. And what I'm gonna do is that right now, at my app level, I'm targeting just that React page because I wanted my whole app to be React Native. But in this case, I'm gonna retarget it to that navigation view page. Page. Yes. And then rerun it. So after it's done figuring out that XAML code that I just wrote, it will launch and we'll see two pages. We'll see a navigation view on the left and we'll see two pages. One will be an info page and one will be home page, which is hosting my React Native app. So here, you can see on the side, we have the native navigation view, we have my sub-navigation, as we saw before, inside that React Native app, and then on this page is a fully UWP XAML page hmm. with hyperlinks inside that. Nice. So this can go a little bit further if I wanted this page to be all React Native, and then I wanted all, all normal native UWP XAML page, and then I wanted just one piece of it to be React Native, I could do that too. So all the combinations or permutations are fully there for you to do, this is just a very straightforward example of that. And the last thing that you can do with this, the, uh, the hosting or React Native inception doesn't stop there. <laughs> Another thing that you can do using XAML Islands, which is a concept that we introduced last build, is that you can host UWP Win 10 apps inside of WPF and Win Forms. And since React Native is using all of our own native stuff, you can also use a XAML Island to host React Native inside Win Forms or WPF. We'll take a look at that app, which is running right here. So as you'll see, I have a WPF app at the top. It has uh, that old style menu control that you might know from WPF here. So popping outside the window, and inside that, it has a XAML island. And as you can tell, it is running the React Native EULA example from the beginning that I can interact with fully. Worldview is all native, and that's all native Win 10 platform app running there. 
Awesome. So I'm going to pass it back off to Paul, who's going to talk about how you can get all this goodness out to your users and your customers a lot better. Awesome. Yeah, so we've covered like the programming model, building the apps, using the React Native platform, using the native platform, interoperating all these things. And so one last piece of the puzzle is deploying these apps. And one of the promises of React Native for Windows that I made at the beginning was that it lets you have a more web-like inner and outer development loop. And you can really serve what we call service deliver or cloud power experiences. Um, just kind of like you do websites today, very differently than the traditional uh, native app deployment methodology. And so if you think about traditional deployment, you go, you build your app, you then go and publish it to various stores, use other kind of deployment methods for that binary code of that app you're publishing. Sometimes there's processes to review uh, those things that take some time, and then your customers finally get those bits. Um, but what if you wanted to rapidly experiment, and you wanted to push out updates to, to your app once a day, or 10 times a day, or as crazily rapidly as you might make changes to a website and instantly have your users seeing those changes. Uh, well, App Center Code Push makes that easy for you to do, and, and the React Native for Windows generally supports uh, this model. Uh, because uh, what you're doing is you're really just pushing those JavaScript files out uh, to customers and updating them. You're not having to do whole binary updates of the app. Uh, and so uh, it's pretty easy to use. You uh, kind of configure and, and get a Visual Studio App Center account. There's a lot of other benefits you get from doing that and hooking up your app to App Center. You install its CLI uh, tool on your computer. And then just like we showed with the React Native Windows project, you just go to that uh, project that you've created, that React Native project, and you install the code push uh, SDK into it. Um, and so that kind of code pushifies uh, your app, as it were. Um, and then uh, you can use App Center, either the UI or the command line interface, to go and push updates out uh, to your app. Okay? And so uh, let's see. Let's try and do that. <laughs> this will be fun because we're going to do stuff over the internet. Yes. Uh, Cross your fingers. Hope it works. So what I have is actually on my Android device, I'm running an app that's installed through React Native. So we have that here. And I want to make some changes. But I don't want to have to force my customers to go to the App Store or the Google Play Store. I don't want to have that wait time. I don't want them to download anything. I just want to make some small changes, some bug, fixes, bug fixes, or I want to push out a, a feature update. But I don't want it to go through the store. So how would I do that? So what you can do is you can use Visual Studio App Center. And in here, it has all of the information and setup that you'd need to, to make that process. So here I've created my RN code push example by adding a new app, and then it gives me an app here. And when I create a new app through this button, it gives me a code, like a key that I can put inside my implementation, my JavaScript that I'm running on that React, uh, on my Android device, and that hooks it up. So if we go in here, we go down to the analytics page. There's actually an amazing amount of functionality that you can do through the Visual Studio App Center. And one of the ones that I really like is the analytics, which gives you a bunch of data and tracking information about how your app is running, how many bug crashes it has, how many sessions you've launched, and that stuff. I may or may not have tested it a lot of times in the past couple days. <laughs> the, you know, you got to test your stuff, right? So it gives you all of that information, including event tracking. So if you've hooked up. Uh, if there's certain parts of your app that you want to know how many times a user has done X, you can, you can check that as well. So that's through events. Let's see here. I may have pushed a button a lot of times, too. There we go. But the process that we want to show you is something called code push, which is under here. And I pushed, you can have two different things, production and staging, depending whether you're basically in alpha or release, or beta or release. And I pushed them to, to staging. I did a lot of pushes to staging, yes. as you can tell. And what we're going to do, if, if we go back to, to this guy, is we're going to push a version out to fix up this UI and make it look a little bit better. So what I have here is I've already written my changes in VS Code. It's like, hey, I want to add an image. I want to clean up that string so it's not running out to the edges of my app. And I want to remove that check for updates button because I don't need to do that with code push. I can just send it out. So I have copied this string because it's a bit long. But this is the string that you'll need to put into your PowerShell and then hit Enter and let it push up your changes. So 
we're gonna go into our PowerShell here, which is at our React Native Code Push demo, and we're gonna control V. And if you don't remember this whole string, do not worry. If you go on to the Visual Studio App Center, they will show you under the Code Push section, here's what you need to push to, and then you push to either staging or production. So you don't have to remember the whole string if you don't want to. We're gonna hit enter. And depending on your internet connection, this will go fast or slowly, but what it does is that it rebuilds, rebundles, and then pushes out to the App Center, and the App Center goes, hey, is this key on any device? And if you have 100,000 users, it's gonna go, yeah, it's on 100,000 different devices. So it goes, cool, now I want those 100,000 different devices to now be running this version of JavaScript instead of this old version of JavaScript. And there we go. So it, it loaded the dependency graph, it's finished, it's bundled, says that it's, it's gone up, it's been successful. Prove it. So now we're gonna go back to the airdrop and I have have my app here and it goes, hey, there's updates, would you like to do that? We're not, and I go, yes, do it. Boop, done. Now I get those changes instantaneously. Nice. So now it's all cleaned up and I've Ooh. fixed the, the visual issues that I didn't like before just through code push. And this app is completely separate, like it's not connected to a USB, it's been installed completely separately from my app, I'm not doing React Native run Android and it's secretly running, like it's 100% separate, and I have, this device has no knowledge of the App Center. It's just a way I can easily push out fixes to my customers. And that could have been an iPhone, it could have been a Windows device uh, mm -hmm. with React Native Windows. Yes. Um, so that's a really powerful way to, and even you can be doing your development on your PC and be updating iPhones, uh, for example, this yes. way too. Absolutely. So it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, uh, so kind of we've shown you kind of some big picture, a lot of details about really building a, an app. We want to talk a little bit about roadmap and next steps and how you guys can get uh, more engaged in, in this project. Um, so React Native for Windows, uh, it's shipping in stable uh, already. Uh, it's, been, it's been out for a while in a community-oriented way, and there's actually uh, you know, fully featured, uh, a, a fair amount of community support for it, and there's apps that already ship to store and, and already deployed and going, you know, going out with the current version that's already there. Um, and as we've talked about, uh, there's a vNext uh, that's on this common C++ core that we've been developing. Actually, all the demos done today were on that new vNext that's in preview now. Um, and this is kind of the future of the React Native for Windows project, is this vNext that we just uh, released in a preview yesterday. Um, it's now in preview. It's on that common C++ core, which has better performance and capabilities, and also makes the Windows version and Android and iOS version stay more in sync. Um, it, the history of this is they used to be three parallel implementations that were trying to keep in sync with each other, and this common core makes them really stay uh, in much firmer sync. Um, there's better performance and quality. I'll show you a perf graph in a second. Um, we've been really building out the desktop uh, experience to make that work better, keyboarding, accessibility, and so forth, as well as the console Xbox experience with gamepad and, and sounds. And, uh, and more, and, and our intention is that by the end of the year, this will kind of replace the V current. So the V next will become the, the V current. Um, and so um, if you went to the talk this morning, the State of the Union on UI platforms, you heard about how uh, UWP XAML is kind of growing in breadth uh, to reach more scenarios and work in more OS versions and so forth. And so uh, this will also get port moved over to WinUI 3 as WinUI 3 becomes available. So all those benefits you heard about that, if you went to that talk, will accrue to React Native for Windows as well. Um, I wanted to make one little point on kind of the perf progress that's gone on. So one of the most important measures of performance for an app is how much memory it uses, and reference set is really the kind of golden standard for how we measure the, the memory impact of an application. And so this is just showing some of the great progress we've had already in the, in the VNEX so far in reducing the, the overhead, the reference set overhead of a React Native for Windows app, and it's really getting very close to just the performance of a pure C++ or C Sharp uh, native app on Windows, as you can see. And it's significantly less overhead as a baseline over, uh, from something like Electron or other kind of, you know, fatter kind of web technologies that are loading in all of web views and, and things like that. And so you can see you get much closer to native kind of memory usage and stuff um, already. Uh, and we've had some good progress there. And we're gonna continue to be working on optimizing that performance. Um, and I just wanted to show you, you know, all of everything we're doing is being done out in the open um, on GitHub, which I will open now. Here we go. Uh, and so we really invite you to come. Oh, you're not. Oh, they're not seeing that. <laughs> but now you are. 
Now you're not. Now PowerPoint has taken over. All right, now you are. There we go. Uh, everything we're doing is, uh, it's the new Microsoft. Everything's transparent and open. Uh, and so uh, uh, all this development is being done in the open. Our issue tracking, uh, pull requests, you're welcome to come uh, contribute if there's a bug or something that's nagging you that you're running into. Um, uh, it's kind of all managed in the, in the open here, our projects. Um, so you can see our progress towards uh, making Xbox work great and, and so forth and accessibility and, and whatnot. Uh, so come, come join us there in the open. Uh, it's really a great uh, community project. And a lot of t uh, people are contributing to it, not just uh, you know, our team in the core platform, but a lot of teams within Microsoft and, and outside. Um, and, and one of the teams that's um, doing great work collaborating with us is Microsoft Office. Um, and so does anyone know what this app here is? Hopefully everyone does. It's Microsoft Word for uh, Windows. And uh, you know, the Office team uh, tries to make world-class experiences for not just Windows, but for many platforms. Uh, things like Word have native apps for iOS and Android and Mac and Windows and web. Um, and they really invest a ton in having world-class, you know, best-in-class experiences for, for users of M365. Um, but there's parts of these experiences that they want to share code. That they want to be able to have some of these benefits we've talked about, about a web-style deployment model uh, in how they're delivering. Um, things like comment. Battery died. Here, we'll just stand really close to each other here. <laughs> Hi, this isn't awkward at all. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just uh, here you go for a second. Is that all right? Uh, just just speak, speak loudly. I'm gonna make it mic. <laughs> just walk over there. Yeah. I know you guys can hear me, but I just want to make sure people online can hear too. All right. Um, and so to, uh, for experiences like commenting, actually, uh, across these, uh, you may or may not know, those are already using uh, React and React Native today. And so if you go and you use Word on your iPhone or Android phone today, that commenting UI, there's actually React Native embedded in there. Um, and what we're showing in the upper left here is actually a dog food build of Word for Windows that's using React Native for that commenting experience too. So they can share code, so they can be service delivered, and they can get those benefits of a web first uh, development model, but still have a really native experience that's great for their customers. It's very cohesive with the rest of their UI and is a world class experience. And so it's not compromising on that because it's very important to the Office team to have those top quality experiences for their customers. Um, and it's not just other teams at Microsoft who are participating in the project. Uh, with us, but uh, a lot of other uh, companies here, just some great companies that are betting on and starting to use React Native for Windows um, and investing on that. And uh, we think there's an opportunity for many of you to come in, participate, and, and take advantage of it as well. Uh, and here's uh, some ways to get started. Uh, get React Native for Windows. Uh, take advantage of VS Code and the React Native tools for VS Code. Uh, check out Visual Studio App Center and start using that for your apps and for your React Native apps with Code Push. Um, so people taking pictures, take their pictures, and then three, two, one. Uh, and there's also other sessions, uh, some that took place, some that are still to come uh, on uh, kind of development for Windows and, and web technologies. Uh, I didn't mention, but TypeScript, a lot of people love to use TypeScript, and you can totally use TypeScript to create React Native apps, not just JavaScript. Um, there's some sneak peeks. Uh, going on about uh, some of the new ideas of things we maybe could build on top of React Native in the future. Um, and there's a bunch of booths you can come talk to us uh, to learn more about these technologies. So, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thank you very much.